Good morning, church. Um, the other day, Rob Swan was here, and he had three pages. Uh, I've got eight. So <laughs> you must brace yourself. No, I'm just joking. Um, I thought I'll just as a brief background. I think there are people that don't know me. My name is Kubus. I'm married to Marika. We've got three kids. They all left home. So yeah, we we staying on our own at the moment. Some students still staying there with us. Uh, we've been in PE since 2010, so we're not a long-term uh, people here. I'm a very technical and analytical people, a person, so uh, yeah, bear with me. Uh, I'm working at the best dairy company in South Africa. You can ask me if you like. <laughs> and uh, for a hobby, I enjoy leather work a lot. And uh, for a sport, I do some running. Um, yeah, I'm... If there's something up here, time to detox. Um, ten ways to detox your body, or eight simple ways uh, to detox. Uh, there are lots of detox going at, uh, on at the moment. I've that, done some internet research, and uh, well, the Americans say there's 75 billion dollar industry, so it's a huge thing. And if you if you look it up, you'll find 89 million results if you just. Uh, say detox. So detox is a big thing for us these days um, and obviously many claims are made but many things are not true as well. But it seems like we sometimes feel that we ne get, need to get rid of, of toxins and stuff. Now in um, Psalm 19, uh, David offers us something else. Um, not, not in a bottle of 120 rand but uh, a similar um, practice or discipline that he says guarantees the, uh, the following things, uh, refreshing the soul, uh, making wise the simple, giving joy to the heart, and giving light to the eyes. So yeah, we, I'm not proposing to you this morning something chemical, I'm going to propose to you something spiritual. Um, okay, I thank you for, Alfreda, for reading us uh, this uh, uh, section out of the Bible, 1 Samuel 15. I'm going to um, go through a few verses there. If you've got a Bible, it will be helpful because I'm actually covering more than what Alfreda read. Um, and 1 Samuel 1, sorry, verse 2. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people, Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they ambushed or waylaid them as they came up from Israel. So there was a, quite a specific uh, instruction that um, Saul got through Samuel. Um, and the question here was, um, why, why did he give him such a harsh, inst harsh instruction? I've looked up, I saw that Samuel lived about a thousand years before Christ, 1,050 years before Christ, and Israel left Egypt 1,450 years before Christ. So there's now instruction to Saul for something that happened 400 years before that time. I'm reading some, uh, uh, in, uh, something from Ex Exodus 17. Uh, I think you're all aware of, of this section, but I never realized it was the Amalekites. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. So there was a, a battle against the Amalekites. Uh, later on in that same section, then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek, Amalek uh, from under the heaven. And then in the, the Deuteronomy 25 verse 17 it says, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out, out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. Uh, they had no fear of God. When the Lord your God give you rest from all the enemies around you in the land he's giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. That is what it says in Deuteronomy 25. God was angry with the Amalekites because they attacked his people 
especially those that were vulnerable and were lagging behind. That happened 400 years ago. Now we're here with Saul, and now he's giving this serious instruction, go. Okay, that's what we'll just uh, read now again. But this happened 400 years ago, and, and the question here was, why did God still hold it against the Amalekites? That was long ago, let bygones be bygones, let's go uh, carry on, but he did not forget. And then in verse 3, now I'm back in uh, 1 Samuel, now go and attack the uh, Amalekites and totally, utterly destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Very clear instruction. Cut it all out. Um, these people have done my people wrong. I want to finish them off. And the other thing that's maybe just worthwhile mentioning, while it was so clear, plunder was often the payment in ancient wars, but God was clear that everything should be killed, killed in this case. So previously, in some cases, they were, they were allowed that the people that went and they fought the, the, this other army and they could get some stuff and they would take it home and that would be payment, but not in this case. Uh, verse 4, so Saul summoned the men and mustered, uh, or numbered, assembled them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Just as a matter of interest, it, he was a serious military leader, this guy. You could master, I don't know how they did it without the aids that we've got these days, 210,000 soldiers. And the other thing that impressed me of him, he, he, he didn't rush into battle. He was obviously a, 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 a mature uh, guy that could do, could do battle. Then verse 7, then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havila to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the rest of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. It started here with this. Then Saul attacked. He took. Saul took Agag, king of the Amalekites. He was the leader. He decided, okay, I'm going to veer off the, my clear instruction. I'm going to save the, the main man. And also, because that happened, I think the army felt, okay, if he can do it, maybe I can do something else as well. So then they, uh, because of his leadership, they decided, okay, let, me, let us rather also not kill all the, uh, the, the good stuff. Um, God's heart was to punish the Amalekites for what they did to his people. The heart was, of Saul was not aligned and tuned into God's heart. And then there's yes, uh, um, uh, some F.B. Meyer that wrote this. To spare the best of Amalek, Amalek is surely equivalent to sparing some root of evil, some plausible indulgence, some favorite sin. For us, Agag must stand for that evil inclination which exists in all of us for self-gratification. And to spare Agag is to be merciful to ourselves. So we must just think as well, if we've got this instruction and it's quite significant, do we spare something or do we follow the instruction that we got from God? I'm over in verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I've made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instruction. Samuel was grieved and angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Saul, uh, God was, a uh, heart was hurt about Saul's uh, disobedience. And Samuel's heart was aligned with God. They just, we are close to God if our heart is broken for the things that break his heart. And if the things that pleases God gives go joy to us. So, if we can cry for the same things that God is hurt, then we are close to God. If, we, if we're happy with for his things, then we are close to him. Verse 12, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. That's a, that we've read. Saul deceived himself to such an extent that he was not aware of his own sin. He was totally blind. Uh, and he didn't think he did anything wrong. On the contrary, he was so proud of himself that he erected a monument in his own uh, honor. Quite significant. Quite, I mean, I don't think he 
thought that he did anything wrong. He was quite explicit about it. And so much so that he thought, well, let me build a monument for myself. Um, uh, verse 14, but Samuel said, what then is the bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. I think Saul said that he followed the instructions, but there was a sound in the background proving that he didn't do what God said he had to do. Speaking is easy in Afrikaans. is a saying, praat is afdraand en doen is opdraand. Easy to, to say something, but more difficult to do something. And here, Saul said something, the evidence was something else. And then, just this sentence is, is really big for me. Uh, they spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. A lot in here. They spared the best of the sheep. He blames the people for the, he, for, for the disobedience. They did it. They, they spared it. Um, he says he did it for a good cause. This is a sacrifice to the Lord. Yeah, he said, well, they spared it, but it's actually for you. Although that was not the instruction. So he tried to soften the whole thing. To the Lord, your God. Not my God, your God. Uh, I, I did it for your God. And then, but we totally destroyed the rest. So there, as soon as there was obedience, I'm included. Disobedience, I'm excluded. Um, and then destroyed the rest. I don't know if you are aware, but it was also a surprise to me. This later proved to be false. As an ironic twist, Saul was killed on a battlefield by an Amalekite. So everybody was not actually killed. Um, verse 17, uh, Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul so said. Yeah, just uh, as it starts off here, although you were once small in your own eyes, he, he was a humble person, but with all these military victories and things that happened to me, him, he obviously grew big and pride was his, uh, in his heart, and he wasn't aware of it. In his heart, that was his real problem. So we must be careful as well. We can be blind to things that, uh, and, and pride specifically, that, that we don't even realize. Verse 22, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed, which means give careful attention, is better than the fat of rams. I just thought uh, to obey is better than sacrifice. Meaning, or if I understand it correctly, sacrifice is good. But to obey is better. So we, we can spend many, uh, well, we can give sacrifices like time or, or money. And it, I think it, that is good. But to obey is better. If, if we just do things... Uh, and, it, and our heart is not in it, and we're not a devoted heart and obedient to God, then it's empty before God. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Now, I didn't know what is divination, so I looked it up, and I found this on the internet. The practice, to practice divination is to uncover hidden knowledge by supernatural means. It is associated with the occult and involves fortune-telling. Divination in any form is sin. It's not harmless entertainment or, alternative, uh, or an alternate source of wisdom. Christians should avoid any uh, practice related to divination, including fortune-telling, astrology, witchcraft, tarot cards, and spell casting. The spirit world is real, but it's not innocent. 
According to Scripture, those spirits that are not the Holy Spirit or angels are evil spirits. Christians need not fear the spirits involved in divination. Neither are Christians to seek wisdom from them. The Christian's wisdom com comes from God in James 1 verse 5. So, just to go back to this text, it says rebellion is like the sin of divination. So if you use tarot cards or fortune telling and things like that, he says here it's similar to a rebellious heart. Quite serious. Uh, if you've got a rebellious heart, just want to do my own thing, don't want to submit to God, significant in the eyes of, of the Lord. Psalm 51, the best sacrifice we can bring is, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, God. Uh, sorry, uh, heart, you, God, will not despise. Contrite, I looked up, recognition that one has done wrong. So our sacrifice that we can bring to the Lord is a broken spirit. In other words, submissive. The last three verses I would like to share. Um, verse 24, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back to, with me so that I may worship the Lord. That was verse 24. Similar in verse 30, Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So significant for me was, I was afraid of the men. And, and secondly, please honor me before the elders. In other words, the people around him that was, quite, was more important for him, the opinion of the people, than the opinion of what God, the clear instruction that, that he got from them. Then lastly, in uh, verse 32, then Samuel said, Bring me Agag. This is now Samuel speaking, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him in chains, and he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. And then Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Again, time did not take the sin of Agag away. The instruction of God to utterly destroy all the Amalekites Amalekites had to be fulfilled. So, even here, um, I think the king also thought, well, there was a lot of talking. It's just this old uh, prophet that's, uh, yeah, maybe everything is past now. Let, me, let us just forget about it and, and carry on. But no, sin, uh, time also did not erase that sin. Um, Okay, so that is, that is the story or the uh, reading in 1 Samuel 15. Um, it's now part of the, the, the sermon that it goes over into application. So my, my question to you is, is, is all of this applicable to me? Does it really? And, and I th then I think our response can be that. Um, it's not applicable to me. How, how do I fit into this whole thing? So um, I want us to, to close, our, uh, close our eyes. I want to pray for us to actually, before we go forward into with this sermon. Search me, God, and know my heart. Taste me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Lord, uh, we just want to bring this, this time of our service this morning really to you. And we ask for a miracle. We ask that you would expose our own lives to you. Help us, Lord, that if there are things that we are disobedient Maybe we are blind in some aspects and maybe in some ways we are deliberate. Please help us, Lord, that we, that we can address them this morning. 
Open our lives up for us, please. Amen. I've, 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 uh, when I uh, first thought about this sermon, I, I had this idea. If you can imagine, this is the instruction of the Lord. It's, a, it's just a solid piece of wood. This is the size. There are three uh, possible ways that we can respond to this. Uh, the first is we can draw a line and say, I, 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 I'll, this is the instruction, but I'll do this. In other words, I'll take a piece away. Um, I won't follow the whole thing. It's just a part. Then the other thing that we can do, I brought my, uh, is, uh, I've brought an alarm clock here, and I'm just going to, to put it, fix it here onto the piece of wood. Um, okay, I'm not going to work, but in any case, uh, it's, it's the instruction, but there's a time involved. In other words, I'll do it, but I'll just do it later. So not now. I'll just put it somewhere up. Then, the last way of responding is, there's a piece of wood, yeah, I think those of you that are close can maybe see there's a problem, but those that you are far will think it's fine. Because this is not, uh, it's not solid wood, it's pressed wood. So, the, the three res possible responses that I want to put to you, if there's a, the, the original instruction of the Lord, is that we can actually reduce it to something that suits me. If I want to put it in my pocket, it's just for me, not the whole thing, I'll take part of it. Or, I'll delay it, or I'll fake it. Reduce, delay, or fake. That's what I... So I want to put those three possible, or four possible responses. We've got a clear instruction, I'll do it like that, or we can reduce it, or we can delay it, or we can fake it. Just want to say something about these three of those uh, things. Um, again, my guy there, F.B. Meyer, says the following. We, uh, first of all, sorry, I'm talking now about the uh, reduction. In other words, don't do everything. We are prepared to obey the divine commands up to a certain point. And there we say, as soon as the best and the choices begin to be touched, we draw the line and refuse further compliance. We listen to soft voices that bid us to stay our hand when our Isaac is on the altar. We are prepared to obey the divine commands up to a certain point, and there we stay. Um, so, yeah, it's fine. If we are safe, it's comfortable, it's quite easy, it fits me, I'll do it. But as soon as it comes close to me, close to my heart, it's not my style or whatever, then I'll say, okay, well, I'll draw a line, and that's it. Um, yes, I, I want to share a story with you. Um, a close family member of ours uh, got a classic car when he was a student. Um, that's the car. Um, he dreamt, uh, he used his savings and spent hours on this beauty. Until there came a time when he realized that it could stand between him and a close relationship with God. He realized he had to sacrifice it, and that's what he did. 80% um, of his worldly possessions he offered to a close friend. Um, that was the instruction. He, he, he was convinced that this thing is going, he thinks too much about it. He must actually get away of, of it. At that stage, he just had debt and very little earthly possessions. And he said, well, if that is then the case, if this thing is going to stand between me and a loving relationship with God, it needs to go. Significant. I mean, I, I wonder who of us myself included, will go that, to that extent and say, cut, this is not for me, whatever it is, um, stop it. And that's what he did. So uh, I think quite a significant example to us. And, and with that, I don't say that uh, we must all give our cars away. The, the, I want to say uh, you can only give what you've got. But we've all... Yeah, we've got many resources. We've got time as well and, and other things as well. But so if there's an instruction, be clear about it. If you've got something, you can give it. But we've all got time. And then the last thing about this, I want to say partial obedience is disobedience. This is what either do the full thing if you make shortcuts. 
Um, this is what Saul did. He didn't do everything. He sort of did it, but God was unhappy with that. So that's the reduction part. I'm now over to the delayed part. Uh, time does not take away the requirement to be obedient. That God indicated with the order to destroy the Amalekites 400 years after the horrible sin that they um, committed. Um, I'm now uh, wanting to say why am I am standing here today. Um, a couple of Sundays ago, I uh, was reading a book called uh, Seeking Him um, and did this chapter on obedience. Um, uh, it, it was quite, it made a big impact on me on that morning and I thought uh, I need to share it with, with someone. As soon as I've uh, had this thought, I immediately thought of it on the other hand as well, but I'm not really qualified and I'm, I'm trying to, to actually uh, backpedal. Uh, if you know me, then you know I'm not so obedient as maybe what I perceive. Um, so, and then I thought, no, okay, no, rather let's leave it aside. But then I thought, well, here it is this delay story, maybe later on, but I've just read that I shouldn't delay, so maybe no, I must do it today. Um, and I thought, well, uh, I'm not belonging to a men's group anymore, so where can I actually share it? Okay, maybe a church, but it's quite um, serious. But, and then I said, okay. If today is the day, I'll pray about it and ask Murray if I can. And then I came to church. Fortunately, Murray was quite busy at the back, so I, um, I, it was okay. <laughs> I was off to home. But later on the day, there was a bride at Murray's house, and again, there were many people, so I was off the hook as well. But then again, <laughs> as I said goodbye to him at the car, it was just me and him. And uh, I said, Murray, I, I, I've got a message. And he said, yes, uh, bring it to the church which I appreciate. Um, but that's, so not because I feel so comfortable here at the front, but because I know it's a message that I must bring to you and, 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 and share with you this morning. Um, so that was the delay thing. I, I tried to delay, but I had to do it. The last way of, or well, not the last, but the, the fake obedient one, uh, as, as in the, in the priesthood, um, we can rationalize and manipulate uh, 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 instruction. And we can convince ourselves that it's quite possible. Uh, but to deceive uh, God is, is totally uh, uh, impossible. Um, I, I think the majority of you may know this, but I thought it's uh, applicable at this stage, is that if you look in the top left hand, there's an area in everyone's uh, life that is... Um, open to, uh, to myself and to you as well. You know, I'm standing in front of you. Everybody knows it. I've told some things about you that I know, that, that you know and I know. And that top right-hand side is an area that I can be blind of. You, you may know it. I may have a funny thing that I do that I don't realize that I'm doing, but you know it or I, whatever. And the, top, uh, the bottom left-hand one is some things that I specifically want to... Uh, um, hide from you, and then there's an area of my life that, that neither you nor I know. But the thing I want to say about this jarring window is that God knows everything. Um, he knows the things I want to hide from you, and He also knows the things that I don't know about myself, that you know. So He, he, he knows everything. So, um, my thought life, you don't know. And, 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 and I want to share two things there of, of my, of my, of my uh, thought life. Is, um, uh, the, there was an event that uh, America and I had. We went out to Storms River the other day, and we had a disagreement there. And um, I realized that I, I, um, in Afrikaans they say, uh, you can say easily angered or a thin skin. The other thing you can say, similar to Saul, you build yourself your own monument and you polish it. And if anyone touches it or comes too close to that, tarnish it in any way, you'll, you'll be um, you're personally hurt with that. So um, that is the thing I'm saying now to this. 
you may think, yes, here I stand. Maybe I'm a, some sort of a religious person or whatever, but you don't know what's going inside. And I want to share with you that that is a battle of, on my side, at least I shared it with Saul, that um, I also want people to think good of me. Maybe, and definitely, um, too much. So I'm saying, what? Uh, uh, there are two verses, or actually, that after this whole event, that it really struck me, and that was uh, in Ephesians 2, verse 10, where, he, where it says that we are God's handiwork. And another translation, it says, we are God's masterpiece. That's what he says. He says that. In Ecclesiastic 7, verse 21, we read it the other day. Don't pay attention to every word people say. Now, whether you're young or old, but that is my battle. In my mind, the um, battle between what does God think of me and what does people think of me. And, and for that, I really need strength. And I need to repeat it over and over. It's a daily battle. Even, even for this sermon, I thought, what can I do to impress you? Because I want you to think a lot of me. I want you to think that I've actually, it's a good sermon that I've prepared and that, you know, it, it worked out well. But, and that, 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 that made me tense. And, and, and when I thought about this and said, no, but it's not actually, it's not me. Well, it's easy to say, you can spiritualize the whole thing. But if, if you can get the message and that God impress you and not I, that is really the message. So uh, I hope you get that. Okay, so um, I'm actually done. It's just the last section. Uh, we, we've said that yeah, you can delay or you can reduce or you can fake or you can do what God says, the real thing, everything. And now it's over to Psalm uh, 19 because that's where I started. Um, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Back to the detox story. Um, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. So if you really want to be refreshed, if you are tired today, <laughs> And, and feel that you need to be spiced up or whatever. Um, think about what God wants you to do. And as I pray just uh, now, as sometimes I think we are blind and we don't really know where are these things that I haven't done. Ask the Lord, pray for a miracle, that he either through people but or through his word expose it to you and say, this is the thing. You must do it. Because here's the promise. Refreshing the soul, making wise the simple, giving light to the eyes, joy to the heart, if we do what God is saying. That's my message. I think I'm more or less done.